Hello and welcome to History's a Blast. Today we're at the Allegheny Portage Railroad National Historic Site Visitor Center and we're going to go through the Visitor Center and walk down through the woods and see some of the remnants of the old Allegheny Portage. Part of the Pennsylvania Main Line of Public Works in the 1840s. So come along. The Allegheny Portage National Historic Site is at the summit of the Allegheny Mountains on U.S. Route 22 near the town of Galitzin, Pennsylvania. It memorializes a short but important 20-year period in the early 1800s when the port cities of New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore and their respective states competed for access to trade with the rapidly developing states in the Midwest. Triggered by the completion of the Erie Canal and Maryland's sponsorship of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal and Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, Pennsylvania undertook to build the main line of public works consisting of a railroad from Philadelphia to the Susquehanna River and a canal from there to Pittsburgh at the forks of the Ohio River. But the Allegheny Mountains in the middle of the state were an obstacle that neither a canal nor the railroads of the day were able to surmount. So the engineers resorted to a series of 11 level sections of railroad connected by 10 inclined planes to lift cargo and passengers over the mountains between canal basins at Hollidaysburg in the east and Johnstown in the west. The visitor center and outdoor exhibits, including the Lemon House Hotel restored to its early 19th century appearance, a reconstructed hoist engine house, and the large stone skewed arch bridge nearby placed the Portage Railroad in historical and technological context. Almost completely absent, though, from an otherwise very well-designed and executed interpretive scheme, in fact, one might say even suppressed, are two key historical facts about the Portage Railroad that need to be mentioned. First, the Allegheny Portage and the entire main line of public works was unprofitable from start to finish. Second, the patchwork nature of the system, combined with safety problems on the inclined planes, such as rope cables breaking, boiler explosions, etc., created expenses and lack of confidence that the Erie Canal just didn't have to deal with. Climate and geography dictated that the canal be closed by freezing conditions for up to five months each year and during periods of low water during dry summer months as well. Johnstown in the west. Little arrows denote the inclines, I guess. Plane four, plane five, yep, there's the summit. And down the other side, the foot of, foot of ten in Hollidaysburg. They've got nice models here, too. The orientation film and interpretive signage completely ignore the need for cargo and passengers to be transferred from rail cars to canal boats and vice versa three times during the journey. An ingenious sectional canal boat design eliminated that necessity to be sure, but in fact there were relatively few of those and rail cars like the models in a display case in a corner at the visitor center were the norm on the Portage Railroad. The costs of time and labor, especially in cargo transloading, were a major setback for potential profitability. As they call them. Here's an early steam locomotive that was also used. This is a, a wooden mock-up. Wow. Early steam locomotive technology, only one driving wheel. That's why the state was only too happy to unload the whole system on the newly completed and privately capitalized Pennsylvania Railroad in 1854 for far less than it cost the public treasury to build. Okay, I have harumphed. Well, this, this wasn't here the last time I was here, which of course was about 12 years ago. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Life aboard a canal boat. Oh yeah. And the Underground Railroad story. The interactive things, try on clothes. Okay, now we'll go on to the walking trail. 
This trail goes down through the woods, wooded hillside. Here we're in the visitor center. And then we're gonna go down to the outdoor displays. The reconstructed section of railroad, the Lemon House Hotel, and the engine house. You see the, uh, the drill marks? Where they, where they actually quarried pieces of stone for the uh, sleepers. See that right there? It's where they chiseled off the, or drilled, and then cracked the limestone to make the limestone sleepers. And here's a little demonstration. This is where that living history guy was doing his demonstration. He was right here on this. Beautiful spot. Rocky limestone hillside with ferns, pine trees, hemlocks, I guess. Yeah, they look like hemlocks. Small needles. There's a tulip poplar. Is that a tulip poplar? No, it's not. It's something else. It looked like a tulip tree there for a minute. And then down there at the end of the trail is the reconstructed hoist house or engine house, which we'll go to in just a second. Oh, this is the Skew Arch Bridge Trail going down through the woods to the Skew Arch Bridge. The old Huntington and Cambria, Huntington and Cambria, Indiana Turnpike. Old picture of it. Here's the inclined plane number six. Looking down toward the bridge. And it's a National Civil Engineering Landmark from the American Society of Civil Engineers. There's the top of the plane going into the, or the top of the, in, yeah, the top of the incline plane going into the engine house. And the excavation of the old found footings and foundations, and then they added some reconstruction here to show you how it worked. boilers over there. The way pit. The engine. The boilers. The sheaves, ropes, and gears. One, perhaps the only positive outcome of the Portage Railroad, was the inspiration that the problematic rope hoist cables gave to a young civil engineer named John Roebling. He came up with the idea of a thinner but eminently safer cable made from iron, later steel, wire. It worked. Public confidence in the inclined planes was restored, but too late to make the system profitable. More importantly, Roebling then launched a career as a famous builder of steel wire suspension bridges, including, of course, the Brooklyn Bridge, which I understand is often for sale on eBay. <laughs> Snort! Okay, now we're on the other side and we see a different rail technology. These are cast, cast iron rail sections resting on iron benches, which are spiked into those stone sleepers. This is a great display. I really like this. They might be wrought iron, I'm not sure. The, the, the benches are cast iron. 
the rails might be wrought iron, but see how short the sections are? Yeah. See the cra see the joints there? Interesting. And there's the famous Lemon House Hotel. Over there is old US Highway 22. And up on the hilltop and down through there is where the picnic area is. Featured in a, one of my very first videos. Portage Picnic. Nice place to stop and take a break when you're traveling. This way. Repeat, there's the level. Oh, it only has one M. I'm wrong. Again, I'm proven wrong. Samuel and Jean Lemon. Moved to his this mountain in 1826 and built a log tavern not far from here. Wow. Set up the way. Dining room area. explaining how people made a living on the public works and the Allegheny Porters Railroad and the nation archaeological excavations there's the original Galitzin tunnel that uh, helped to make the Portage Railroad obsolete when the Pennsylvania Railroad finished the Horseshoe Curve and the tunnels under the mountain. Prosperity for Holidaysburg on the eastern foot of the slopes. Okay. There's Debbie. This is the tap room, the tavern side. Card game going on. Wet your whistle. parlor for guests to relax. You got ashtrays there and a spittoon on the floor. <laughs> People use tobacco in all forms. I want to mention some things that I learned when I was here when there was a, a ranger giving a talk years ago. But they've done careful research. They stripped these walls and this is probably about 20, 25 years ago. They stripped these walls and found what the original colors were. And these are colors from pigments that were available in nature. You didn't have, you know, man-made pigments back then. So these are colors that, that people would have used in, in their interior paint schemes at the time that the Lemon House was an active hotel. And the other thing is the floor, of course they've got a, they've got a carpet walkway to protect it but the floor is actually canvas that's painted so they, they just painted the checkers and the diamonds on canvas and you can see here where it's actually the seam and it's been tacked and it's been tacked down with actual wrought iron nails too or tacks there. So they did a really good job of researching. You know, I, didn't sh I didn't show you the dividers here, so the room could be divided into two smaller rooms. And going back, that's, the, that's where the, dis the uh, placards are. And they've got children's games over here too, so very interactive kind of interpretation here. See if I can get this to work here.
Oh, didn't work. But anyway. Oh, and they've got the inevitable. All right, this one's missing an arm. Okay, so. Here's a typical table setting. Looks like mashed potatoes and lima beans and pork and biscuit and an onion. Pretty neat. Looks like dessert pudding over there too. Okay. Well, now we can go ahead and move on. I think we'll go back to the visitor center and get our passport stamped and then drive around and go down to the skew arch. What do you think? Here's the skew arch bridge over incline plane number six. And we're looking sort of down through the arch toward Hollidaysburg. Come around and it crosses under the grade of the highway. This is the west or the uh, yeah the westbound lane of old US Highway 22. Over there in those bushes goes the Pray to the incline up the hill toward the Lemon House. That's it for this time. I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll take time to view some of our other ones.